Mike DeBurgis along with Anthony Carlo for episode number three of the Sports Sit Down. And Anthony, a most disappointing week if you're a New York football fan. And let's start with the New York Jets. A total stinker <laughs> in Kansas City. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Six interceptions. Come on now. No, six interceptions. Worst game of his career. I mean, this guy has played 12 years in the NFL, and this happened to be the worst game. Look, the Jets, it was a total breakdown. We knew that Arrowhead was going to be tough for them. We knew the Chiefs were going to be a tough team. But did you expect them to fall apart at the seams like they did? It was incredible because as bad as they played, there were so many opportunities for them to get back in the game. They couldn't do it, and it really falls at the feet of Ryan Fitzpatrick. He needs to give back some of the money he got from the New York Jets this year. That was a total disgrace. Now, the Jets sit at 1-2. 1-2, and two. One and two, they should be 2-1, and one, and they're in jeopardy of going 1-3. and three. Completely unacceptable, but everybody who looked at the Jets and looked at the first six games said, you know what, they could be 2-4, and four, and they might be on that path. Right, but they can't be on that path if they're turning the ball over eight times. And that was also another problem in this game. But you know what, Mike? I'm not losing faith in Todd Bowles as the guy Why? for the How job. How could you not lose faith, you know faith in him? I think that it's – it's. there's no question about it. It's a step – Far, far up from where Rex Ryan was bringing this team. And Todd Bowles, the message is still where it needs to be. He's not giving up on this team. He's calling for solidarity. And I think that he's the guy that needs to get this job done. Who else would you expect at this point uh, to do the job? Anthony, what kind of solidarity are you going to have if you're 1-3? and three? You're playing the Seattle Seahawks. I know they're not the Seahawks from a couple of years ago, but still they come in with a big stick. The Jets are a mess. Ryan Fitzpatrick stunk right. up the joint against a Kansas City defense that was really nothing. They Listen, were nothing. It is difficult for me to defend Todd Bowles after this past week because it wasn't only Ryan Fitzpatrick's fault. I mean, there were also mental breakdowns on the coaching there, staff as well. There have been mental well. breakdowns since, since week one. They and have been. Blown coverages. Everything you could think of, there have been breakdowns with this team. And this all falls at the feet of the head coach. Maybe Bowles isn't the person we thought he was. You know, I, I, I see what you're saying, but I just feel as if we can't jump to all conclusions after week three. I mean, it's been a couple of, of games, you know, a few games into this season. And, you know, to blame Todd Bowles and say he's not the guy for the job after the Jets were not a horrible team last year. I mean, they took a step up. I just think it's unfair to put it all on his shoulders when I like his work ethic, I like his message to this team, and I feel as if this team does have the potential to turn it around. Okay, speaking about messages, let's talk about the message uh, Coach McAdoo has with his New York Giants. <laughs> the New York Giants were ahead 21-9 to yeah. mm -hmm. against an 0-2 Redskins team. They were only two quarters plus from going 3-0. and It's very special to be a 3-0 and team in the NFL, and this is a game they completely blew once again. But we saw it coming. We saw drop passes in the first two games. We saw enough mistakes in the first two games to kind of see this coming. But this is a loss that the Giants should never have if they're going to be a playoff team to lose to the Redskins, <laughs> who are basically being knocked out of the NFC East race, and they couldn't do the knockout punch. Yeah, they should have buried the Redskins when they had the chance. Uh, you're right. It was a game they should have won, but they're not going to win it if Eli Manning's throwing two interceptions when the and Giants had a chance just, And, to and it come wasn't back. just the two interceptions. No. He was missing guys wide open. You're playing under perfect conditions. It's September, 70-something degrees, no win. You can't be missing wide open receivers like this. And, no. and Eli was. He had a bad game. You can't throw two, two interceptions in the second half and expect to win. I mean, parts of this game was despicable. I mean, the, the fake punt pass that the Redskins ran, the bomb they threw late in the game. I mean, it, it was terrible to watch. But the big question that emerges from this game is, of course, is Odell Beckham a passionate player or is he a sore loser? And after seeing the way that he broke down on the sidelines, I think that's a question everybody's thinking about. Well, absolutely he was, and it really lost focus on the game. Odell Beckham, if you're going to be a superstar in this league, you need to compose yourself. And through the years and the decades, actually, we've seen some of the best talented receivers mentally break down on the sidelines. We saw it with Keshawn Johnson used to do it. Sure. We saw it with Terrell Owens. Michael Irvin, you know, every now and then had a breakdown when they weren't winning the Super Bowls all those years. O ODB, you got to get control. The Redskins really controlled him for three quarters. He made some big plays in, in, in yeah. the fourth quarter, but for three quarters, really kept him under control. Yeah, I mean, he still had 100-plus yards. He had seven receptions, so he did his part. I don't hate the fact that Odell Beckham Jr. gets as uh, passionate as he does. 
I know he was but flinging. But you can't be, you can't be slamming equipment. things I understand. And, and getting hit in the face. You know, he, almost, he injured himself I by know. doing that. He's losing control. The guy's banging his head against a metal medical cabinet. I, you can't <laughs> be doing that. And he's taking coaches' attention away from the game. I mean, because they're focused on calming him down rather than looking at the field. Well, ex exactly to your point, Eli Manning addressed it in the post-game conference. You know, you know, you know, he had to go over there and talk to Odell Beckham. Yeah, he's trying to figure out what was going on, why, why it was frustrating. It seemed like we were, you know, he was getting catches, he was making plays. And, uh, you know, just need him, you know, we need everybody to stay calm. We don't need to get, get rattled. We don't need to get fired up. Um, you know, you can get excited, celebrate your teammates, but, you know, we just got to keep, I don't know, I don't know why. Um, you know, we just got to do a better job offensively, everybody, just staying, staying calm and staying in our rhythm. Uh, Eli Manning looked really confused in that post game. He, his answers were short. He didn't understand it. He knows the Giants blew a golden opportunity. And when the quarterback has to go over to his receiver to calm him down, when he should be thinking about plays to win the game in the fourth quarter, you know, you're really taking the attention away what it needs to be. And Odell Beckham's got a focus here. Right. But to, to finish this conversation off about the Giants, it really wasn't Odell Beckham who broke down in the end. It was the Giants as a whole. 11 penalties, three turnovers. I mean, it's just inexcusable. I think even though he was a focus during this game, the way he lost control, it wasn't the biggest problem. Well, the Giants have the work cut out for them. They have to take on the Vikings Monday night in Minnesota. You know, one of the best defense in the league. The Vikings just spanked the Carolina Panthers. Yeah. So yeah. they got their hands full. And, you know, it looks like the Giants, instead of being 3-0, and and maybe you could give a pass to being 3-1, and looks like they're going to be 2-2. Two and two. Moving to baseball, there was a rock'em, sock'em bout <laughs> in Toronto. Well, not so much. It wasn't that great a fight between the Yankees and Blue Jays. It wasn't. Uh, listen, I watched this game, and the, the biggest thing that came out to me, look, I have to be honest with you. I enjoy seeing the, the, the fights. I enjoy seeing some brawls because you don't see it happen as much as it used to uh, you know, in, in past years. But when watching this game, one thing stood out to me. The umpires didn't take control, okay? You have Hap on the Blue Jays visibly throwing intentionally at Chase Headley, throws the ball behind him, and they don't even warn the guy. Very next pitch, hits Headley in the back, and they don't throw him out of the game. They issue a warning. I, I'm a Yankees fan, but and I'm trying not to be biased with this one, but the Yankees had all rights to go after the Blue Jays after that. Well, to be honest with you, I don't think this was much of a fight at all. Uh, <laughs> and the umpires have been a disaster for, for over a decade now. They, they just really don't control the game. Uh, they don't control the strike zone anymore because every pitch is, is being watched on videotape. They, they, they don't get the right calls on the bases, again, because of the videotape. Yeah. Uh, umpires have lost a lot of credibility over the last 10 to 15 years. But you talk about brawls. I mean, this was nothing compared <laughs> to 2003 when Pedro threw down Don Zimmer in, oh. in the playoff game. Now let's go back to oh. 1976. Lou Pinella rounding third base, taking out Carlton Fisk. And Greg Nettles basically pummeled Bill Lee and ended his career. You YouTube that, Yankees 1976 oh. brawl versus the Red Sox. That was a fight. There wasn't much of a brawl here. There, there wasn't much going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were being punches thrown in, in 1976. Nothing yeah. compared to this. Hey, but I loved how CC Sabathia was going right after Josh Donaldson. And Donaldson was going after him until he realized how much bigger he was. He started to back away. And there was a huge grin on CC's face. I loved it. Listen, I mean, you need some excitement in baseball. The only thing that I didn't like about this is how it all sparked from Luis Severino basically throwing a strike that nicked Josh Donaldson in the arm, right. and this comes out of it. I mean, the Blue Jays, I feel, were just in the wrong in this one. Well, the Yankees certainly made strides for this year. We've got a little preview of what to expect next season in 2017. So at least they're going to go into the postseason, you know, looking towards next year. But, you know, another year the Yankees aren't going to be in the playoffs for the most part. Right. I just want to finish one note with this. I uh, forgot to mention, I didn't like how Russell Martin was challenging Sanchez, the Yankees' mm -hmm. young Star-studded catcher one-on-one. -on -one. Did you see that? I did see that. He, he was, grabbed he him was, to the yeah. side. He goes, yeah, he you and him me. On. Yeah, Listen, Russell on. Martin's been in the league for years. you got to show more class and right. respect than that. This is a, a young catcher who the Yankees don't want to get hurt. I don't know what Sanchez was saying to Martin, but it looked like Martin was trying to egg him on. And that's just not in the cards for, for a game like this. I think it was uh, uncalled for. You know, I'm kind of surprised in baseball now. The players know each other so well. So much money is at stake. You don't have the brawls, like again, like you had in, in 76. Uh, even in, in 98 between the Yankees and Orioles, there was, there was a tremendous oh, brawl where Daryl Strawberry got, Tino got, got punched in the face oh, and Tino got drilled in the, back in the back by Armando Benitez. Yeah. But you know, good thing no one got hurt, and the Yankees certainly don't want uh, the, the young star catcher no. getting hurt at all. No. That wraps things up for episode number three. <laughs> for the sports sit-down, he's Anthony Carlo. I'm Mike Demurgis.